Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just started the recording for the class and um, we will get our class started. Uh, how's everybody doing? Dave, how are you doing? How are you, Thomas? Good, Pastor. Great and good. Good. How was your weekend? Very good, Pastor. Good. Um, are uh, churches meeting in person in there? Uh, not uh, some of the churches. Uh, yeah, since our uh, different uh, districts have their different rules, okay. so the districts uh, they are following their own uh, system according to what the government or the CDOs and the mayors have given. But ours I and mean, the Kathmandu we have they haven't allowed yet, but. Outskirts of Kathmandu, they have already started. A few of our daughter churches have started um, physically meeting. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Good. So, how is it, Aaron, in, uh, in uh, uh, sorry, Nagaland? Or uh, how, how the judges meeting there? Or All right, I'm not sure if Aaron can speak uh, on the connection. Okay, good. Thomas, you're doing good? Yes, Pastor, yeah, I'm doing good. good. Thank uh, you. Ha have you started a meeting in person yet or your congregation? Not yet, Pastor. Not yet, not yet. Okay, we are giving some time. Okay. All right. Okay, so welcome, Kiran, as well. Uh, let's pray and then we will start. I'm sure the others will. Um, join us in the meantime. Could um, somebody just uh, pray and commit this uh, lecture uh, for God to uh, equip us? Somebody could pray. Okay, others are just coming in. All right, uh, Thomas, why don't you please pray and then we will start. Yeah. Sure, Pastor, I'll pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful day, O oh Lord. We bless you, Father. You are so good. We love you, Father. We praise you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this wonderful time of learning. Father, let the spirit of wisdom rest upon us, Daddy. Help us to mm -hmm. understand from your word, from the prospect of the spiritual things, O oh Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Once again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting. Kanan, how are things in your area? Are uh, churches meeting in person or not yet? Yeah, we are uh, doing. But uh, not making too uh, noises. On, uh... People are... Uh, yeah, in person, but uh, people from far away, they are not coming. Only uh, people from local. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. It's almost, it's, uh, it's, uh, almost secret. <laughs> oh, secret why is it? Oh, you're not allowed to meet in person? Yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, they said some... Uh, rules and regulations about this uh, re religious uh, prayer and all but they didn't say about the uh, churches. What, churches yeah yeah they said about closing but they didn't say about the uh, opening mm -hmm. so okay. we are doing that okay okay all right yeah so different places there are different uh, things happening all right anyway so uh, hopefully, you know, uh, over the next month or so, we will be able to, uh, and I, I don't know, uh, here we have, we've started meeting in person in Bangalore, but um, again, it's not, uh, uh, you know, people are slowly starting to come uh, to worship in person. Uh, we have a good number are still uh, staying online. So let's see how this all uh, transition is going to happen and how we're going to 
you know, get back to ministering and doing things. It's it's a learning process for all of us uh, as we go through this. Okay, uh, let's get into our, um, our 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 subject here. So we've been talking about um, urban church planting, and just last week, uh, we changed focus to talk about the spiritual side of starting a church or a Christian ministry in an urban context. We uh, we spent quite some, I mean, the early part of the semester in doing the, talking about the practical things, things that we could do as we go about uh, starting a local church or a Christian ministry. So the, uh, the, the thoughts we've shared uh, can apply to either starting a local church or a Christian ministry in a city, in an urban context. So then we said, um, while all the things we do in the natural, uh, practical things are important, uh, we must also understand the importance of the spiritual side. So we're spending a few lectures on that. And uh, I'm not uh, necessarily going into uh, a full in-depth study on uh, the spiritual side, simply because uh, these things are covered uh, in other courses. Uh, we have a full course on prayer and intercession. So uh, in that course, you have learned about praying, interceding, um, praying for cities, so on. Uh, we also have a you know separate course on uh, uh, the believer's authority, where you have already learned that every believer has been given spiritual authority uh, when we confront uh, demonic powers. So... Uh, I'm just building on that, just touching on it, uh, not going into details on um, you know how to go about intercession, so on. Just giving us an overview. But what I do want to impress uh, upon each of our hearts and minds is this: that whatever ministry we are doing, uh, and of course, it doesn't matter where you're doing it, whether you're doing it in the city or whether you're doing it in a rural setting, uh, we must be very mindful that. Christian ministry is not just about the practical methods, uh, tools that we use and all of those things, that really Christian ministry is a spiritual ministry. We, it's, a, it's a spiritual work. And of course we use, you know, the natural methods and tools that are available for us to carry out the work. So keep that in mind. And that's uh, something I just want to bring to bear upon our, Hearts as we look at urban church planting. So, just to quickly review what we covered last week, we said the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. So, we are engaging. So, in as much as we engage, we as God's people engage. Uh, sadly, there's all kinds of demonic activity also going on in the city, affecting people. And so, we need to counter those things spiritually through spiritual means that, that God has given to us and also be very strategic in how we go about these things. So we we said, okay, let's just you know, review on you know, what, what does Satan do in trying to hinder people from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ? He blinds the minds of people through various ideas, philosophies, deceptions, uh, you know, so trying to, prevent people from seeing the light of the gospel. He also holds people in bondage through, uh, we can look at, consider these things as spiritual prisons. Uh, he holds people uh, in bondage to sinful deeds or could be to uh, social evils. Uh, they could be, uh, you know, strongholds that are established in regions spiritually we're talking about. Satan also hinders the proclamation of the gospel, just to prevent us from bringing the gospel to people, uh, whether it's through persecutions or putting other kinds of hindrances in the way of God's people as they go out to bring the gospel. So we must be aware of that. And lastly, we also said that, you know, uh, if we are not careful, the enemy comes all the way to infiltrate into the church, into the body of believers because you know if if the believers are divided the believers are affected 
then they won't even do the work of reaching the city. So Satan has his own schemes of trying how to invade the local church. And we just looked at Re Revelations, uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Just to get some insight there, you know, when Jesus is talking to some of those churches, he's actually pointing out what Satan is doing there. You know, and he says, look, Satan is doing this. Uh, he, he's, he's established a presence there and he's going to attack you. Or uh, there is false doctrine that's infiltrating the church. There's a false prophetess uh, who's got gained access into the church. Or there's a group of people who will come against you, but I'm going to give you victory. So there are different spiritual dynamics happening and uh, we must be aware so be on guard especially as you're starting a church or a ministry that not only is the enemy trying to or is going to try to prevent us from taking the gospel out to people but if he if at all possible he's going to try to come inside our team our work to cause disturbance and we have to stand on guard. And as a leader, you have to be very careful uh, because you know, in general, the congregation may or may not be aware of these things. They may not be mature enough to discern what the enemy is trying to do to infiltrate the congregation, the local church body or the Christian ministry. So as a leader, the person who's heading up, you, you, you're, you know, you're on guard and maybe some few other spiritual leaders with you who are discerning, who are watchful, you know, whether some false doctrine is coming or people are coming in that are causing division and so on. Uh, so you've got to be careful to protect the work and uh, you shouldn't let you know, uh, the enemy destroy uh, the work that you have invested your life for uh, to do or to establish. And so they have to be careful in that sense. So we talked about, you know, the church's responsibility here in the spiritual battle. So the church is not a passive uh, participant where we stand there and say, oh, there's a devil and God, you do something about it. No, the church, meaning believers, we have been given authority. We have been entrusted with the tools or the weapons. And uh, that simply means we, the church, have to engage spiritually uh, to advance the kingdom of God. And so, you know, we have to slowly train uh, the congregation, slowly train people saying, hey, learn how to pray uh, for the city. Learn how to pray for people who are in bondage, who are oppressed, uh, who are, you know, who don't know the truth yet, learn how to pray. So we need to teach the people, you know, the weapons of our warfare and how to use the keys of the kingdom that Jesus has given to us so that we can advance uh, the kingdom of God, right? So uh, how do we go about it? So the next chapter, uh, we said there are two things we need to do. We need to pray and we need to exercise spiritual authority. So we pray, uh, how, you know, and just we just outline some of the things that we pray for, uh, and we pray, and, and these are all based on scripture, right? So we pray and say, God, you said, ask of me, I'll give you the uh, the heathen for, the, for your inheritance at the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So we ask, you know, for people in this region, this city, this nation, so you're praying based on the word. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and bring about conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You ask God to draw people to himself, you know, the, the particular city or the region that you're, uh, that you're targeting. Uh, you ask God to grant them repentance so that they would be able to know the truth and escape the trap of the enemy. Uh, you ask God to grant them wisdom revelation, the eyes be opened. So they may know, uh, they may know the Lord and know His purposes. We ask God to send laborers into the harvest. And we ask for signs, wonders, and miracles to be demonstrated. So these are things that we can pray for, all geared towards advancing the kingdom uh, in the region or the city where you're planting the church 
are establishing a new Christian work, right? Uh, at the same time, we have to exercise spiritual authority, right? Now, in order to exercise spiritual authority, uh, some basics about spiritual warfare, uh, we need to be established in truth before engaging in spiritual warfare. Because if we don't know the truth, then we won't know how to fight the enemy uh, effectively. You know, we, 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 may be, we may be doing some things that are like spiritual warfare, but if you're not doing it from a place of being established in truth, we're not going to be effective. So what is the truth we must be established? First of all, that Satan has been defeated. Right, so this is important, and uh, you know when we are getting people to engage spiritually, uh, they need to be taught that you know when we are contending against demonic powers, we are uh, we are operating from a place where Jesus has already defeated the enemy. Yes, Kiran, you have a question. Um, okay, you want to type your question in the chat, Kiran? You have your hand raised, so I'm not sure. We can't hear you. Okay, anyway. Uh, I'll just continue. Um, Karen, if you, uh, we can't hear you, so I'm not sure if you have a question. Oh, it wasn't. Okay, it's fine. fine, fine. All right. Um, that's not a question. All right. So, um, so we need to establish people in this truth that Satan has been defeated. And I've just, you know, given these scriptures here, which we're all familiar tells us Satan has been crushed, he's been expelled, he's been condemned or judged, uh, he's been disarmed, he's been destroyed, and he's powerless. So this is Satan's uh, state after the cross. On the cross, Jesus did this. So today, when we are you know, exercising authority with the enemy, we're not trying to defeat him. He's, he has already been defeated. But we are enforcing that victory to bring about a change, right? So it's not so much as we are contending against the devil or his demons to or overpower them in the sense of, you know, this is the first battle. No, Jesus already overpowered them. We are saying, look, we're coming in the, on the basis of that work and you have to leave. Leave the people that you're, you know, holding back. So we had to be established in that truth. Secondly, we had to be established in the truth that we as believers have complete mastery and dominion over the enemy. So whatever you know, you and I see in the city ha happening in the city, uh, it can be very, it can be very intimidating. So, you know, just take example in the city, the problem of suicide, or the problem of you know, drug abuse, so on. These are huge challenges. They're not small things, huge. Some cities may be crime, may be a big thing. Some other cities may be oppression of people, uh, of the voices of the people may be a big thing. You know, so different cities will have uh, challenges that are different, but uh, these th things can be so big, you know, uh, they're not small things. But we need to approach them with the understanding that we have complete mastery and dominion over the powers of darkness that are behind those things. Right? So, example, if it's drug addiction, right? Of course, people are affected. And there are powers of darkness holding people in bondage. There are also the drug smugglers, because otherwise the, drug is not, the drugs are not going to get to the people. 
and there are demonic powers controlling those things. And so we said, we have authority, complete mastery or demonic powers that are either holding people in bondage or that are uh, empowering these people who are pushing drugs into the hands of the consumers. So the problem is very big. It's not a small problem. In this, I'm talking about the city, but we must approach it from a place of dominion, that we do have mastery, we do have dominion, with the powers of darkness that are behind these things. And that's what we are targeting. You know, we, we ourselves don't have the license to go and, you know, uh, deal with the people physically, that that's something the, you know, the government, the police, people who are authorized to do it, can, you know, work in the physical realm as far as that is concerned, talking about drugs and so on. But we have spiritual authority or the powers of darkness, right? So we must, and we must be confident in that aspect, you know, and, and I'm just using drugs as an example, but whatever the problem is that we are seeing affecting people, whether it's just community or a com bigger region or the city as a whole, we say we have mastery, we have dominion over what the enemy is doing in that space. Thirdly, uh, we are not contending for victory, but we are to enforce Christ's victory in that space, right? So like uh, we said this earlier, uh, the work has already been done. Jesus has already finished the work on the cross. As, as the church, we are enforcing that victory into that area. You know, we are here to say, Satan, you've got to release the people. Then you've got to, you know, pull, and we are here to pull down the strongholds so that people can come out free. All right. And then number four, the fourth truth is that we must be confident that we are protected as we keep all entry points closed. The Satan and his demons cannot harm us in any way. And I've, again, given scriptures here, and uh, we are probably familiar with these scriptures. Um, we are not fearful that as we engage in prayer, spiritual warfare, oh, Satan's going to retaliate, and he's going to come and put us down and harm us. No, that We don't have that kind of fear, and we should not have that kind of fear. And uh, kind of just emphasizing this because too many believers have this, you know, like a preconceived idea that the moment I start praying, the moment I start interceding for my city or engaging spiritual warfare, or oh, Satan's going to retaliate, I I'm going to face a backlash and this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Uh, I want to just say that while the enemy can attack anytime, whether you pray or not, he's he's out there to steal, kill, and destroy. The thing is, we must be the have the mindset that the devil cannot harm us, Satan cannot harm us, because Jesus said it very clearly, Luke ten nineteen, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he's given us his word very clearly. And so we operate from that perspective as we engage in prayer and spiritual warfare. Satan cannot harm us. We are not afraid. While we pray, while we intercede, while we go against demonic powers. And lastly, uh, we also understand that our authority is exercised primarily through words we speak, right? So these are truths we must be firmly established in as we get ready to pray and exercise spiritual authority. So we want to teach God's people these things, right? So just quickly uh, went through a review of those things. So how do we exercise spiritual authority uh, over the city or region or community? Very important. We establish God's presence through praise and worship. So we see in many places in scripture that 
uh, praise causes things to change in the spiritual atmosphere. It's a way by which we are enthroning or establishing God's presence. And uh, it causes the enemy uh, or dethrones, let me say. It dethrones the enemy, dethrones what the enemy is doing as we establish God's presence through praise and worship, right? So we intentionally, um, you know, uh, we praise, we worship, whether it's in small groups as a congregation or uh, in, in when you come specifically for times of prayer and intercession, we also uh, engage in praise and worship. Number two, we proclaim the finished work of Christ on the cross uh, for the souls of the city. That means we are speaking words and saying, you know, this group of people or this area, this region, this city has been washed by the blood. The blood has been sprinkled for every person. I'm not saying they're automatically saved. What I am saying is provision has been made for them to be saved. Because the Bible says he will sprinkle all nations with his blood in Isaiah 52. So uh, we declare that the blood has been sprinkled, has been shed for every person in the city. And number three, so we're going forward from here now. We intentionally engage in warfare over specific things where the enemy is engaged, in which we feel we need to go after. We need to go um, after those things. How do we do it? We do it by the words that we declare. Right? So we declare, or we announce. Right? So that's powerful. We said our words, our words are our weapon. Right? So we speak the word of God, and we also declare saying, you know, we pull down these strongholds. We declare the light of the gospel over into the minds of these people. We announce to the devil and to demonic powers, you need to take your hands off these people. You know, we want the light of the gospel to go in. So we are engaging in spiritual warfare through the words we speak. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus in Matthew 8, 16, Jesus cast the spirits out with a word. That means he got them out of people. We're just speaking a word. And so we understand that words carry authority and we release words that enforce our God-given authority over people, over regions. Right? So we also destroy the works of evil spirits that are at work in the people. So Ephesians 2 tells us that there is a spirit of disobedience that is at work, the spirit of this age that is at work. So we come to confront those demonic powers through our words, and we say, you've got to release the people. You've got to release that community. You've got to release... Uh, uh, people from the stronghold that you have over their life, over their minds. And so we speak words to destroy what the enemy is doing. So basically we are exercising spiritual authority to open prison doors. You know, Jesus put it like this. He says, he said in Matthew 12, how can one enter into a strong man, a strong man's house and spoil his goods Unless you first bind a strong man, then you will spoil his goods. Right? Just saying to get to take over what the strong man has, you first bind the strong man. You're dealing with him spiritually, so that you can spoil his goods. Uh, so there's that picture there of uh, of a of a ruler who's got control over subjects, and in order to release the subjects, you first deal with the strong man. So that's what we are talking about. Okay, so now we move forward into another aspect of spiritual warfare uh, or uh, a spiritually affecting change. We must proclaim the uncompromised gospel 
with the power of God. Right? So, this is part of our spiritual battle. We have to proclaim the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. And we have to proclaim the uncompromised gospel. That means uh, we are not here just to talk about some nice philosophy or some nice idea. No, we have to proclaim the gospel. That means Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, he rose up again, and he destroyed the power of sin, Satan, and death. And uh, so we proclaim the full gospel. That means not only can you have your sins forgiven, but uh, there is salvation for your spirit, soul, and body. But you know, he will heal, he will deliver, he will work miracles. So the proclamation of the uncompromised gospel is part of our spiritual battle. It's part of what we do. Secondly, we must also keep in mind the importance of reasoning with people. See, uh, and, and, and you've learned this in your course in apologetics that, you know, when Paul went into some of these big cities, he took time to reason with people. Reasoning alone will not save people, but reasoning helps prepare them to hear the gospel, to receive the gospel. Because they have questions in their minds, and these questions are genuine, legitimate, um, and these questions have come up because of whatever they've been exposed to. And so we need to be able to provide answers, valid answers, uh, in response to those questions. It doesn't mean that, you know, just because we gave answers, they're going to get saved. But when we provide answers, it paves the way for them to then consider the gospel. Because they feel that, okay, what they're saying, I understand, makes sense. And so let me explore what the gospel is about. So we need to also do that as we proclaim the full gospel and demonstrate uh, God's power. No, uh, you know, as, especially in our world today, and I've been kind of just thinking about this, what kind of a world would we be getting into uh, post-pandemic? You know, that is, once we reopen churches and uh, get back to ministering and we are able to go out and evangelize in the city. I mean, begin to do things to reach people in the city. Uh, what kind of a world are we encounter or will we be encountering? I've just been thinking about it. And I'm not saying I have all the answers, uh, but there are two things that at this point are uppermost on my mind. Uh, one is, the question about God, because, you know, a, a common question that came up throughout the last year and a half or more is, where is God in all this? You know, if, if there is a God, uh, why isn't he <laughs> stopping the pandemic or why isn't it just going away? I mean, whatever the cause was, you know, however it started. Uh, why isn't God just stopping it when there are so many people suffering and dying because of it? So this whole question about God, who is God? Why, where is he? Is he there? Um, why didn't he do this? And, you know, how do we know there is a God, especially in the midst of something that has affected the whole earth? in uh, such a big way. So that's one big question that people have. The second area that, that I feel is would be very important in a post-pandemic world as we begin to engage with people, are, and this is something that's more, uh, I would say, some of the people are talking about, is uh, all of the mental health struggles you know, uh, because of the whole pandemic, being locked down, uh, being at home, being isolated, 
uh, all kinds of things. There are a lot of mental health challenges. And it's become, you know, we're seeing and hearing more and more of that these days. Uh, people have been affected mentally, emotionally, because of, you know, these 18 months or more of uh, the pandemic. So we are going to face a world where, you know, people are struggling emotionally, various ways, and we can identify, you know, these challenges. So this is where, when the church is reaching people, especially in the urban centers, and we're able to go out and interact with people, uh, do some evangelism, do some, you know, meetings or seminars, whatever, uh, we should be have something to help people. And I feel in these two areas, there could be, you know, other areas and we need to think about it and we need to find out. But in these two areas, in a post-pandemic world, as we begin to go and talk to people, do ministry, or, you know, start evangelizing, reaching people, uh, Personally, I feel these are two areas that we should have some re answers. We should have something to give to people. The whole thing, but where is God? Is God there? How do I know he's there? Why did he let all these things happen? And does he really care, you know, so about God himself? And secondly, about the emotional, mental struggles whether it's uh, fear, whether it's uh, different kinds of uh, things like an anxiety and uh, uh, the just the thing of getting back to uh, meeting with people, so on. You know, people, the different kinds of child mental health challenges and we need to have answers. So that's part of our spiritual response. Because we are not coming with, here, we, we are going to bring the word of God. They're going to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? as we reason and demonstrate. So in this whole area of you know, reasoning with people, uh, we need to show them that the, the preaching, the message has answers and can address their questions, okay? So uh, I just took a little bit of time on that because it's something uh, I'm just also thinking about, uh, you know, what would ministry look like, uh, you know, maybe two, three months from now, um, or say at least in January, when we are able to go out and start things again, what, what should we be really ready, you know, prepared for or preparing for as we start talking to people, you know, outside. So I just thought I'd share that. Anyway, so we are proclaiming the uncompromised gospel with the power of God. So we pro proclaim the full gospel, have answers for the questions, the things that are on people's minds. Uh, and uh, that will help open up the way for them to consider the gospel. Thirdly, the last one that we want to talk about, is we need to break controlling powers over communities. So here we are looking at specific communities that we are trying to reach. And there are different things that are controlling them, those specific communities. How do you know it? We can see some biblical examples um, uh, and this may not, it may not be manifesting exactly the same way, but they're giving us indications. In Acts 8, uh, when Philip goes to Samaria, he sees that the Samaritans, meaning the people there, are under the control or under the, you know, the influence of a sorcerer. Now, of course, the towns or um, the towns in those days, in Bible times, were nowhere close to, uh, were very, very small. They were nowhere close to the size of 
towns and cities of today. So those days, it would probably be several hundred people, maybe a few thousand people. Uh, uh, so, but the point is that entire town was controlled by, uh, spiritually controlled by a man. So when Paul uh, and Sergius Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they go um, uh, into the island of, uh, oh, I'm not getting the name now. Anyway, uh, the governor of that island, this is an Acts 13 on the very first missionary journey. And they sail from Caesarea and they go to the island of Crete, I think. And then on the west, so on the east coast, uh, so they go on to the west coast and that's where they meet this man. Sergius Paulus, ah, I'm not getting the name of the place. Anyway, um, so they meet this man. And here, the, the governor of Paphos, Paphos is the name of the town. So the governor, Sergius Paulus, is actually under the control of, again, a man who's practicing sorcery. So you see, again, that in order to bring the gospel to that town, uh, uh, they had to deal with spiritual control of the man. Uh, then Paul and his team came to Philippi. There again, uh, a large part of the city was controlled by uh, a, a girl who was con who herself was under the control of a spirit of Python. So this demonic spirit through this person was influencing all these people. And when she was delivered, everything changed in that city. We see the same thing in Acts 19 in Ephesus that there was this goddess Diana who, who was being worshipped and people were under the control of that. But when that influence was dethroned, uh, it affected the city and there was a huge result. People, a lot of people turned to the Lord. So as part of our spiritual strategy, uh, we need to pray and say, God, how do we overthrow the controlling powers over this a certain community or a certain sec cross-section of society that's under that influence, okay? So how do we exercise or, uh, you know, as, as we exercise spiritual authority, we are proclaiming the gospel, the full gospel, we are answering questions that people have in their minds uh, about things. So that, that's a bridge we are building. And then we are also breaking controlling powers through the preaching of the gospel, through the demonstration of the gospel over those communities. So the preaching of the gospel dethrones uh, the controlling influence of uh, darkness over that community. So that's how the gospel has to be preached. Okay, so uh, the proclamation of the gospel has to be with the full gospel that brings healing and deliverance. It has to address questions. It also should confront the powers that are controlling the people. Yeah, I, I hope I made myself clear, right? So part of our spiritual engagement is, so we've done our praying, we've done the exercising of spiritual authority, but now we're talking about bringing the message of the gospel, which has to come in the power of the Holy Spirit. It also should be something that can answer the questions of people it also should confront the powers that are influencing those groups of people. So the preaching of the gospel should confront those things. And the, when, when those powers are dislodged, we see people being saved, people turning to the Lord. So the preaching of the gospel should do that. And it will vary, of course, from 
region to region or community commu community to community, what needs to be addressed. So for example, let me just, just give an example. Let's say there's a community that is an uh, example, let's say prostitution. So let's say there's a red light, a certain district in the city, usually it's called the red light, red light district, where um, there's all of these things, like prostitutions happening. So we do the praying, praying and interceding for that, that group, that area, people in that area. We exercise our spiritual authority. We speak words that liberate. We speak words that dislocate our demonic powers are doing. But then we also have to bring the gospel. So we find ways to bring the gospel to these people. So we must proclaim the full gospel. That means that Jesus Christ can forgive you your sin, but he can also set you free from all of these things, these activities, these bondages. And of course, you have to address both sides. There are people who are forced into that kind of an activity, and then there are people who are behind the scenes controlling those things. So you have to address that, preaching the gospel. And uh, we also have to address some other questions that are on their minds. So what would be questions that these people uh, engaging the red light district have, a, you know, some people may not think it is wrong. So it says it's another way of making my, uh, earning my livelihood. So why is this kind of an activity wrong? Why is prostitution as a way of earning a livelihood wrong? Uh, you know, so those are things we have to address or, you know, how, how, how what would normal life look like if I were to come out of this, uh, we have to address that. And then the preaching of the gospel should also address controlling powers. So the whole, I, uh, in, in this case, it's, it's just uncleanness and there's uh, immorality that's prevailing here. So the gospel, preaching the gospel should, it should, should bring a sense and not from a condemning sense, but in a liberating sense, an understanding of truth, an understanding of righteous living, an understanding of holiness, not from a sense of putting people under condemnation, but liberating them to say that, hey, that's such a better way to live. So when we proclaim the truth like that, we are actually dislodging demonic powers that are telling people immorality is the way to live, uh, uncleanness is okay but we are dislodging those demonic powers, the influence of those powers, as we let people understand through the preaching of the gospel that holiness is so good, righteousness is so beautiful, and, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. So we're helping them move uh, into that kind of a life through the proclamation of the gospel. And we actually dislodge uh, the controlling powers of uncleanness and, and immorality over that uh, community. Okay. I hope I was able to explain this and that you understood, uh, you know, what I was trying to get at here in proclaiming the uncompromised uh, gospel. Let me just see if you have any questions. Uh, do you have any questions on that? that oh, was it clear? Okay. All right. I see answers in the chat there. Okay, so this is how we engage spiritually and proclaiming the gospel is a, is a powerful or an important part of spiritual engagement. But, um, you know, uh, we have to preach the full gospel. We have to address questions and we have to dislocate controlling influences over the people that we are reaching, right? So let's pause here for today. I think uh, we, we should be able to complete this section on uh, spiritual aspects tomorrow. Uh, we'll do that. And then we will move forward uh, into the lifestyle of a church planter and some other things that we want to cover, okay? So we're gonna pause here today. Uh, this. Um, 
Let's close in prayer before we dismiss. Can somebody pray with us and then we will dismiss. So that if your mic is okay, would you be able to pray? Yeah, sure, sir. Okay. Prabhu, <clears throat> thank you for the day I've given us. Thank you for helping us all to be together in this class, Lord. God, as we learn, I just want to pray that we'll be with us, guide us, and lead us. And uh, it's just every one of us as we are in the final year, God. May we be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Have uh, Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.